Welcome to the third part of our four-part interview of MIT professor Tim Hua Chao. In this episode, we'll dive into his policy work and partnerships with cities. All right, we can move now to your uh, some of more, your uh, policy work. So Professor Chao's lab uh, collaborates widely with transit agencies like you touched on earlier and governments around the world. For example, he leads MIT's Men's Manus and Machina program in Singapore, exploring how AI and automation will affect cities and work. In this segment, we'll discuss how those government and policy partnerships help translate research into real world transportation solutions. So you've worked closely with the governments and transit agencies around the world. Can you give us a case where your work informed a policy change? Uh, sure, yeah. We, we get the, and we have the luxury of working with multiple cities, uh, as I mentioned, Chicago, London, Boston, Washington, DC, Singapore. Uh, let me give you one uh, example that's uh, a little bit technical, but related to the policy decision there. That is, uh, how do you understand the demand pattern of a city, right? Uh, let's say if we, we said uh, there are half a million iPad or MacBook demanded in Boston area, half a million, that's one number described the demand quite clearly, right? But if, but if you say that there are half a million trips in Boston, that's actually not a precise answer, mm -hmm. uh, far from complete. Half a million trips could mean totally different things, right? Uh, here, uh, to define a trip, you have to be location specific and temporally specific. Uh, here, for example, we for this half a million trip, we have to say from which station to which station, at what time, by what mode. All this combined can define the demand pattern. Yeah. So in, in the field, we call it origin destination matrix, right? Mm -hmm. This matrix is a fuller description of the demand pattern than just to say half a million trips. God. How do you get this uh, OD matrix, right? Uh, this is actually from London, the United Kingdom. Uh, before MIT worked with the TFL, Transfer for London, uh, the, the agent, the, uh, the, the authority and operator used the traditional survey methodology, just like many, all, all the other agencies. Uh, you go to the station, uh, you ask people, yeah, where are you come from? Where do you go? And they record into survey. In London, there's about to say 600 some stations, uh, multiply by some 600. So 600 by time 600. And you may want to say six time period. So time, six time periods a day, seven days a week, uh, then, with a different type of people, senior, with concession, or by uh, trip purposes, you will find this OD matrix can quickly explode to tens of millions record. Yeah. To do that manually, what well, takes a lot of time to actually collect this data, right? Uh, in fact, in London, this whole exercise is called rolling origin destination survey, ROS. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the reason it's called rolling is because uh, TFL cannot finish the survey in the year. They they distribute the whole survey across ten years in order to finish one single survey, right? because the gigantic nature of the demand pattern, right? So you can imagine from one side the OD matrix is crucial to make any decisions on transportation planning and operation. From the other side, it takes ten years to collect the data. This yeah. right, so. Uh, that's 2006, um, MIT, at that time I was a student. Uh, uh, my professor, Nigel Wilson, sent me to intern at, uh, at uh, TFL. Uh, start that point out, we helped develop this uh, automatic origin destination matrix inference based on the smart card data. Right? That's the first example of using this modern data and a computing technology to understand the demand pattern, both universally, continuously at low cost. Right? Mm -hmm. That took us almost three years to develop the methodology. But then it takes TFL another three years to embed this technology throughout the business process. For example, if you're doing service planning, doing service control, measuring service reliability, inform customer information, making demand prediction, you can all use this uh, origin destination matrix to support it. Right. So it changed the business process and policy related to that. But it's uh, 
based upon a technical innovation that MIT researchers contributed to. You're like revolutionizing the data collection process in quite a substantial way. Right. So with the rise of private shared mobility services, how do you envision the role of public transit evolving? Can these systems coexist synergistically or is there a risk that the competition will undermine public transit? Right, I mean, the, the ideal of course is to, uh, is for these different modes to coexist, right? Yeah. Um, in a pure uh, kind of uh, idealistic scenario, you will imagine having say the subway system be the backbone of the high demand, the high density corridor uh, for the buses to provide the feeder services to those major stations and have autonomous vehicles shared ride to provide this ad hoc local scattered demand, right? That's the idea. But of course, for this idea to be realized, it's not clearly not natural or auto automatic. Uh, it will require a lot of design thinking and a policy intervention here, right? Uh, in transportation, there's a, a, a classic example for market failure because of externality, right? That's congestion, right? My driving a car not only imposed cost to me, but also imposed cost to everybody else, to the system. Yeah. But uh, for most individual behavior, uh, 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 for most individual uh, agent in the system, they only see the private cost, not the broader social cost, I right? See. So we need this uh, uh, policy framework to mitigate this uh, externality. Right? Mm -hmm. So for the competition between uh, shared mobility service or, or autonomous service with public transit, if the competition is managed in the in the moderate scale, this potential be very constructive. Yeah, we actually simulated a scenario where both the public transit and the autonomous vehicle can adjust itself in responding to each other's uh, action. That's a classic uh, game theoretical framework. Right? You can find the natural equilibrium. For that, is natural equilibrium not the system optimal, but it's also, in certain context, could be positive. For example, through this competition, public transit may uh, reduce the coverage to some degree, but concentrated to the high demand area while the autonomous vehicle can be used to serve this low density scattered demand. Got it. Hmm. Then at the same time, you can potentially improve the, the, the equilibrium from natural equilibrium to a more or better system optimal level. But that requires the interventions through congestion pricing or direct physical control, right? There are actually, I would say as a researcher, quite exciting because uh, this opens so many possible design options there. Yeah. Uh, I hope that more researchers or younger ones like yourself can participate in this uh, design of the new phase of the technology. All right. So we were just talking about your work in Singapore through the Men's Manus Machina program. You explore how AI impacts the future of work and learning. So how do you see AI reshaping urban mobility and employment landscapes? Mm, that, that's a, really a big question. Uh, many people are... Uh, uh, I would say speculating on this. Mm -hmm. uh, for now, let me just give you a concrete example. Uh, as part of the Men's Medicine Machine Program, we are working with uh, uh, Singapore Changi Airport. Right? Yeah. Changi Airport now have four terminals and they are building the Terminal 5, expected to open by 2035 also. Mm -hmm. Terminal 5 itself has the capacity of the T1 to T4 combined. So effectively, T5 will double the capacity. <laughs> For the moment, Changi Airport has about 50,000 people serving all different uh, functions to, to, to maintain the, uh, the, the airport here. Right? 50,000 people makes the airport functional. Uh, T5 will double the capacity, but Changi Airport management told us that they do not have another 50,000 people to hire. Mm -hmm. So capacity needs to double but labor can only grow by maybe 20% or 30%, right? So we're working with Changi Airport to use AI and uh, robotics to help improve the productivity of those labors. 
so that we can serve the double capacity with uh, uh, less than double of this uh, labor theory. So we're working with uh, very concrete uh, uh, functions. For example, today to change the wheel of the airplane, that's about 200 kilogram wheel, it's quite a heavy wheel. It, it takes about uh, four uh, technicians and uh, this uh, 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 assistant to change the wheel. So we're working with them to design the AI facilitated uh, uh, robotics to reduce the number of employees needed from four to maybe two or even one. Wow. We don't think we can reduce to zero at the moment, mm -hmm. but potentially be one with uh, robotic support. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, I see uh, another function is the cleaning the cabin. When we uh, uh, board the, the plane, uh, typically they will send seven crew mem uh, members to clean the cabin. Yeah, they have to clean the cabin uh, within say 45 minutes or one hour, right? So now it takes seven people to do that. So we're working with them to say, can we design certain robotics or AI support so that can reduce from seven to three, yes, right? So these are the very concrete tasks we're helping uh, uh, Changi Airport to improve the productivity there. So I, I know Changi Airport is already a very special airport to visit, but maybe in the future, the airport itself can be a destination. So people go to Singapore to see the airport and the AI rather than the city itself. Oh, very much. You know, the uh, it's already a reality there. Mm -hmm. Singapore treat Changi Airport indeed as a destination. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a, it's called a jewel is a combination of entertainment, shopping, restaurant. It, it's a, one of the city center in a way. Yeah. Many people go there, in, in, uh, I mean, enjoy themselves. One last question on your research and policy work is how do you balance the local context of each city with broader global lessons in your work? And what have you learned about adapting policy recommendations across different cultures or urban systems? On that, what we learned once is um, uh, we've been facilitating is this cross-culture learning, mm -hmm. right? Because we get the privilege to work with many agencies across the globe. And we often see their experiences. Many are similar, some are different. So we provide the role not only bringing primary research, new knowledge, but also we are a conduit to bring knowledge we observe from London to Chicago, from Chicago to Hong Kong. So that's one thing we're very consciously doing. Uh, uh, just give you one, one example. In public sector, uh, they are typically risk averse for good reasons there, right? So if you have some new idea, you can convince the city to do something in two different ways. The first one is through, you can, you can persuade through logic saying we did this calculation, here's the simulation, you uh, reduce the reliability, uh, reduce the passenger waiting time by 2% if you do this, right? That's, that's one way to make, a, make an argument. But we find there's a second way to make an argument, often much more powerful and simpler in a way. You simply say that, oh, we observe three other cities, they are doing this and very successful, but therefore you should do it, mm -hmm. right? So these are two different, very different, persuasion techniques. Often you'll find in the public sector, the second way, the fact that we, we observe the success and best practice from other cities, and we can borrow them and transfer this knowledge to another city. It's a very effective way of convincing this city to introduce a new technology or new policies. You're both studying human behavior, but there's also human behavior embedded in the interactions um, that you have. Very much, I think here, the key thing is the, the behavior of whom. Mm -hmm. So here, often we say the behavior of the passengers, right? Of the drivers, of the 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 wild of the customers. But very important part of the behavior is the behavior of the decision makers. Thank you so much for watching the third part of this interview. In the next part, we'll dive into innovation, startups, and the future of transportation. If you enjoyed this video, hit like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more. See you next time.